Let's start the review once again for chapter 3, question 1. Use Descartes' rule of signs to determine the different possibilities for the number of positive, negative, and non-real complex zeros for the following function. We have f of x equals negative 2x to the 4th plus 9x cubed minus 5x squared plus 3x minus 7. Let's use Descartes' rule of sign. We'll look at the variation in sign. This is a negative. We have one variation here. We have a positive to a negative. That's two variations. We have a negative to a positive. That's three variations. And again, we have a positive to a negative. That's four variations in total. According to Descartes' rule of sign, we can have at most four positive roots or we can decrease this number by a multiple of 2. So 4 minus 2 is 2. So I can also have two possible positive roots. I could decrease this by 2 again. I can have zero possible positive roots. So these are the possibilities for the positive roots. Now to check for negative roots, I have to look for f of negative x. And that means I'm going to plug in a negative x everywhere I see an x in the original function. So this is negative 2 times negative x to the 4th plus 9 times negative x to the 3rd minus 5 times negative x squared plus 3 times negative x minus 7. f of negative x simplifies to this is a even power so this is a positive x now this is negative 2x to the 4th this is an odd power so this is negative 9x cubed this is even so it becomes positive that's negative 5x squared 3 times negative x is negative 3x and this is negative 7 now I can look at the variations in sign let's look at the variation in sign now this is a negative to a negative no change a negative to a negative no change a negative to a negative, no change. Now, how many negative possible roots do we have? Well, since there's no change, we have zero possible negative roots. Now, the last part of the question is to figure out how many non-real complex zeros there are. Well, to determine that, we have to look at the fundamental theorem of algebra. The fundamental theorem of algebra states that since this exponent is an exponent of 4, we must have 4 roots, counting multiplicity. So if we have 4 positive real roots, well then there will be 0 complex roots. If we have 2 positive real roots, well then, since we have 0 negative real roots, then that means there has to be 2 complex roots, so the total is 4 roots. And finally, if we have zero positive roots and zero negative roots, well, there has to be four complex roots so that the total number of roots is four. And this is our solution. We have four, two, or zero possible positive roots. We have absolutely no negative roots. And we have a possible zero, two, or four complex roots. In question two, we have the exact same type of problem. We're just going to use Descartes' rule of signs once again. So let's look for the positive real roots. Now, how many possibilities are there? We'll look at the variation in sign. This is a positive to a positive, no change. This is a positive to a positive, no change. This is a positive to a positive, no change, no change, no change. So we have no variation in sign, therefore, there are zero possible positive real roots. Now let's look for the negative real roots. To find that, I need to find f of negative x. That's equal to 7 times negative x raised to the fifth plus 6 times negative x raised to the fourth plus 4 times negative x cubed plus 9 times negative x squared plus negative x 
plus 10. Again, all I'm doing is substituting the negative x into everywhere I see the x. Now, since this is an odd power, this is going to be negative still. So that's negative 7x to the fifth. This is even, so this is positive 6x to the fourth. This is odd, so that's a negative 4x cubed. This is even, so it's going to be a positive 9x squared. This is a negative x plus 10. So this is our f of negative x. And let's look for the variation in sign. We have a negative to a positive, that's one variation. We have a positive to a negative, that's two variation. A negative to a positive, that's three variation. A positive to a negative, that's four variation. And a negative to a positive, that's five variations. So that means for the negative roots, that means I can have at most five possible negative roots or we can decrease this by a multiple of two. So I can have at most five negative real roots. Decrease that by two. I could have three. Decrease this by two. I could have one. So these are the possibilities for the number of negative roots. I could have five, three, or one. Now let's look for the complex roots. How many are there? For the complex roots, we'll have to look at the fundamental theorem of algebra. Again, the fundamental theorem of algebra states that the degree of the polynomial is the number of roots. So in this case, we know the degree of our polynomial is 5, so we have to have a total of 5 roots. So let's suppose we had 0 positive roots and we had 1 negative root, well we have to add up to 5 so I can have at most 4 complex roots. Now let's suppose we had 0 positive roots and 3 negative roots. Well that means we have to have 2 complex roots because we need to add up to 5. And finally if we have 0 positive roots, 5 negative roots, well since the number has to add up to 5 this must mean there are 0 complex roots. So use your reasoning to figure out the number of complex roots. You just need to make sure the total is 5 roots. Question 3. The function negative x to the fifth plus 74x cubed minus 108x squared minus 433x minus 252 has the following graph. Now, for this question, we want to use the graph to factor the polynomial. This is a very complex polynomial, but we can factor it quite easily given the graph. The first thing I want to find is the zeros of the graph. That's where it crosses the x-axis. And we can see several different zeros. We have a zero at negative 9. There's a zero at negative 1, 4, and 7. That's the first step. Since we know the zeros of f of x, we can figure out what the function should factor as. Since we know the zeros of our function, we know the factors of our function. f of x has to have a factor of x plus 9 because negative 9 is a zero. It has to have a factor of x plus 1 because negative 1 is a zero. It has to have a factor of x minus 4 and x minus 7 because 4 and 7 are also zeros of our function. So this is the starting point of our function f of x, but we need to also make sure the degree is the same. If we were to multiply all of this out, this would be x times x times x times x. The leading coefficient would be x to the fourth. That's a problem. We need the leading coefficient here to have a power of 5. The power has to be 5 because the degree of the function is 5. So that means one of these factors has a multiplicity of 2. Now which one of these has a multiplicity of 2? Well, let's look at the function again. Notice here there is a bounce. We have a bounce. 
The graph bounces off the zero at negative one, so the multiplicity of x plus one must be two. So we'll need an exponent of two. Now let's double check. This would be x times x squared times x times x. That would give us a power of five. So we're getting close. We're getting close, but we're not quite done yet with this problem. We have taken the zero into account. We have taken the power into account. Now we need to figure out if the end behavior is correct. The power is five. So for an odd graph, we know the end behavior is supposed to look like this. The tail on the left is supposed to point down and the tail on the right is supposed to point up. But since this is the opposite direction, that must mean there is a negative in the front. Since the tail on the left here is not facing down, the tail on the right here is not facing up, and we have an odd power, that must mean there's a negative coefficient. So we'll have to insert a negative in front of our function, and that's it. This is the function factored. In question four, I want to graph the polynomial function. First, we want to factor it if it is not in factored form. Luckily for us, it's already factored. So the first step is to find the zeros of this polynomial. X squared is a factor, therefore zero must be a zero of this polynomial. X minus two is also a factor. So we know two must be a zero of this polynomial. And x plus three is a factor, so I know negative three must be a zero of this polynomial function. Now let's look at the multiplicity. I know the multiplicity of zero must be two because the exponent for the x is two. So this has a multiplicity of two. The multiplicity of two here must be a multiplicity of one because the exponent is just one. The power of the x plus three factor is the power of two. So the multiplicity of negative three must be a multiplicity of two. Now, why do we care about the multiplicity? Well, the multiplicity tells me if it bounces at the x axis or goes through. Since the multiplicity is even, we're going to have a bounce for the zero. Since the multiplicity of two is odd, we're not gonna have a bounce, it's gonna go through at two. Since the multiplicity of negative three is even, we're gonna also have a bounce at negative three. The next step is to look at the end behavior. If I look at my polynomial function, we have a power of two, a power of one, a power of two. All together, if I were to multiply this out, I know the leading coefficient would have a power of five. We're looking for the end behavior of a polynomial function that has odd degree. Since the exponent is odd, I know the left tail should face down and the right tail should face up. I also note that the leading coefficient is a positive number, so we know the end behavior has to have a tail that faces down on the left and a tail that faces up on the right. We can also add more information. I can find the y-intercept. The y-intercept is pretty easy to find. All we need to do is find f of zero. Let's plug it into the function. That's zero squared times zero minus two times zero plus three squared. That's clearly going to give us a zero. So I know the y-intercept for this function is zero comma zero. So let's put all of this information together. We know there's zeros at zero, two, and negative three. We know there's a multiplicity of two for the zero, so we're gonna have a bounce at zero. We're gonna go through two, and we're gonna have a bounce at negative three for the zeros. 
we know we're going to start off with the tail facing down and on the right we're going to have the tail facing up. We also know the y-intercept is at 0, 0. The first thing we want to graph is the zeros. We know there's a 0 at x equals 0. There's a 0 at x equals 2. And there's a 0 at x equals negative 3. I know my function is of odd degree. Since it is odd degree, I know the tail on the left should go down and the tail on the right should go up. Let's start on the lower left. We know the multiplicity of negative 3 is even, so we have to bounce off negative 3. We'll curve back down here, but we have to pass through the y-intercept, which is 0, 0. And we know the multiplicity of 0 is also 1, and that's odd, so we're going to have to shoot through this. And then we'll curve back down. And we'll have to bounce off 2 because the multiplicity is 2. That's even. So we'll have to bounce off the x-intercept and face up here as we go to the right. So this is a rough sketch of our function. We have zeros at negative 3, 0, 2. We have to bounce off negative 3 because the multiplicity is even. We have to go through 0 because the multiplicity is odd. We'll have to bounce off 2 because the multiplicity is even. And then we'll go to the right. Question 5. Find a polynomial of least possible degree. The key phrase here is least possible degree, having the graph shown. The first step is to find our zeros. We know the zeros are at negative 4, 5, and 6. Since each of these zeros just shoots right through the x-axis, they do not have a bounce, we know all of these have an odd multiplicity. And since we want the least possible degree, we'll say all of these have a multiplicity of 1, just to make sure our polynomial is least possible in degree. We have our zeros, we have their multiplicity, now we can write our function. f of x should be equal to some constant, we don't know yet, we'll have to solve for a. We know the factors has to be x plus 4 because negative 4 is a 0 and we have to have x minus 5 and x minus 6 as a factor because 5 and 6 are also zeros of our function. Now the next step is to look at the y-intercept. The y-intercept is 0 comma 60. We can use this fact to solve for a. If I plug in a 0 into the function, the output is supposed to be 60. The output is supposed to be 60 when we plug in a 0 for the x. So let's do that. a times 0 plus 4 times 0 minus 5 times 0 minus 6. Recall that f of 0 is 60. 0 comma 60 is the same as saying f of 0 equals 60. So I can replace f of 0 with 60, and this is equal to a times 4 times negative 5 times negative 6. We can simplify 4 times negative 5 times negative 6, and so we have 60 equals 120a. We could divide both sides by 120. A is equal to 1 half. That allows me now to write my function. F of x should be equal to A, which is 1 half times x plus 4 times x minus 5 times x minus 6. So this is our function of least degree having those zeros and that particular y-intercept of 0, 60. Let's sketch the graph of the rational function f of x equals 3x over x squared minus 2x minus 3. The first step is to find the x-intercept. And in order to do that, we'll set 3x over x squared minus 2x minus 3 equal to 0 and solve for x. Notice that the denominator does not matter because 
if the numerator is equal to 0, the entire function would be equal to 0. So let's divide both sides by 3, and we have x is equal to 0. So the x-intercept is going to be at x equals 0. To find the y-intercept, we're going to look for f of 0. We'll plug in a 0 into the x, and we'll see what we get from there. This is equal to 0, so that implies that the y-intercept is also 0, comma 0, as well as the x-intercept. So we have one point at the origin that is both a 0, a y-intercept, and an x-intercept. Now we can look for our vertical asymptotes. To find our vertical asymptotes, we'll set x squared minus 2x minus 3 equal to 0. And then I can solve for x. To solve for x, let's factor this as x minus 3 times x plus 1 equal to 0. And this means x could be equal to 3 or x equals negative 1. We have two vertical asymptotes, one at x equals 3 and one at x equals negative 1. Notice the degree of the denominator is one more than the degree of the numerator, so we have a horizontal asymptote at y equals 0. So we have everything that we need. Let's sketch the graph of this function. We have everything we need. Let's sketch the graph of this rational expression. I have vertical asymptotes at negative 1. I have vertical asymptotes at x equals 3. We also have a horizontal asymptote at y equals 0. We have a 0 and a y-intercept at 0, 0. Now we need to test some regions. We need to look at the graph to the left of negative 1. Recall our original function is f of x equals 3x over x squared minus 2x minus 3. I need to test a value to the left of negative 1 here to figure out what the graph looks like. So I'm going to just check negative 2. Plug in negative 2 into the original function here and you should get negative 1.2. Please check that work on your own. Use a calculator or do the steps one by one. You should get negative 1.2. That means the graph here on the left has to be facing down here. It approaches the horizontal asymptote on the left and it points down as it goes to the vertical asymptote negative 1. Then we'll check a value between negative 1 and 0. So I'm going to check in negative 0 0.5. That's directly in between. And I got here a value of 0 0.857. So this is a positive number. This tells me the graph is going to be above the x-axis. So it's going to approach this vertical asymptote here on the left. And it's going to touch the origin at 0, 0. Now we need to check a point between 0 and 3. So I'll use 1. I'll check f of 1. So plug it again into the original function and see what you get. I got negative 0.75, so we know there is no bounce here, it must go through, so it's going to decrease and approach this vertical asymptote here. And now we'll have to check on the calculator again, something that's above 3, let's check f of 4, and I have 2.4. That means the graph is going to be strictly above the x-axis, so it's going to look something like this. It's going to approach the vertical asymptote on the left and the horizontal asymptote it's going to approach as it heads towards the right. So this is the rough sketch of our rational expression. Question number seven. Let's graph the rational function f of x equals 4 over x squared plus 1. Let's find the x-intercepts first. We'll set 4 over x squared plus 1 equal to 0. And you will notice that if you multiply both sides by x squared plus 1, we get 4 equals 0. And that is not true. 
This forms a contradiction. Therefore, the function can never be equal to zero, which means we don't have the x-intercept. There is none. There is no x-intercept at all. Let's find the y-intercept. To find the y-intercept, we'll find f of zero. We'll plug in a zero into the original function and we'll see what we get. We get f of zero is equal to four over one or just four. So f of zero is four, which tells me the y-intercept is zero comma four. The vertical asymptotes is where the denominators are equal to zero. So we'll set x squared plus one equal to zero and solve for x. We'll subtract one to both sides. I have x squared equals negative one. And if I were to take the square root of both sides, you would realize you get x is equal to plus or minus i. That also tells me that x squared plus one is only equal to zero for imaginary values, which means we don't have any vertical asymptotes. So for our vertical asymptotes, well, well there's none also. We don't have any x-intercepts, we don't have any vertical asymptotes. Is there a horizontal asymptote? Well, yes, there is a horizontal asymptote because we look at the power of the denominator. That's larger than the power of the numerator. So we have a horizontal asymptote at y equals zero. So let's figure out what this graph looks like. We have a y-intercept at zero comma four. We have a horizontal asymptote at y equals zero. And you could always test some regions. You can plug in values if you like to get a better graph. But I know since we have a y-intercept here, the graph is gonna look something like this, where it curves down and approaches the asymptote here on the right, and it also curves down somewhere and approaches the asymptote on the left. This is the rough sketch of our function. Question eight, the pressure exerted by a certain liquid at a given point varies directly as the depth of the point beneath the surface of the liquid. The pressure at 90 feet is 270 pounds per square inch. What is the pressure at 10 feet? In this question, we know the pressure exerted varies directly. So I can write an expression P equals K times D. We know it varies directly, so I'm gonna use multiplication with some constant K. We also know we're gonna generate 270 pounds per square inch at 90 feet. So I can plug in the values. 270 equals K times the depth, which is 90 feet. I can solve for K, so let's divide both sides by 90. And K is equivalent to K equals three. So our constant here is three. That means our formula can be rewritten as pressure equals three times the depth. So this is the formula we can use to predict pressures at any depth now. We can answer the question, what is the pressure at 10 feet? So we'll plug in D equals 10. P equals three times 10. And so I know the pressure is going to be 30, 30 pounds per square inch. This is our solution. The pressure is 30 pounds per square inch. Question nine, the resistance in ohms of a metal wire temperature sensor varies directly as the temperature in degrees Kelvin. If the resistance is 510 ohms at a temperature of 170 Kelvin, find the resistance at a temperature of 250 Kelvins. We'll have to construct another formula. Notice it says again, varies directly, so I know it has to be a multiplication problem. 
Here we're comparing the resistance in ohms to the temperature. So I can write R equals K times T. And I know it's multiplication because of the phrase varies directly. We know the resistance is 510 ohms. And that's equal to K, which we're going to solve for later, times the temperature, which is 170 Kelvin. We can solve for K here. Let's divide both sides by 170. And so our constant is equal to 3. So our constant is 3. And we can rewrite our equation. Now our equation is R equals 3 times T, which is the temperature. Now we can solve for the actual question. It says, what is the resistance at 250 Kelvin? So R is equal to 3 times 250. And this gives us the resistance. The resistance is 3 times 250, which is 750. So our solution is 750 ohms. In question 10, a pair of markings a set distance apart are made on highways so that the police can detect drivers exceeding the speed limit. Over a fixed distance, the speed r varies inversely with the time. For one particular pair of markings, r is 90 miles per hour and t is 8 seconds. Find the speed of a car that travels a given distance in 9 seconds. I can construct again another formula, but this time it says varies inversely, so we know it's division. R varies inversely as the time. So R equals some constant K divided by the time. Again, I know this is a division problem because of the phrase inversely. So let's solve for K. We know at R equal to 90, the time is 8 seconds. So let's say 90 equals K over 8. And I could solve for K. Let's multiply both sides by 8. I would get K equals 8 times 90. K is equal to 720. So that's our constant, which means we could change our equation into R equals 720 over T. Now we can answer the question. Let's find the speed or the rate of the car as it travels 9 seconds. So I'm going to put R equals 720 divided by the time, which is 9 seconds. And now we can solve for R. 720 divided by 9 is going to give us 80. 80 miles per hour. So this car was traveling 80 miles per hour.